Well, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. My name is John Robbins. Once again, we're thankful for your presence as we continue our study of the Gospel of John. Tonight, we are going to begin with the 27th verse of the 12th chapter as we continue the saga of Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. Interestingly enough, as we've mentioned before, one of the things that's really important for us to discover in the Gospels is how often women play a significant role in the ministry of Jesus, particularly with regard to their ability to be an example to everybody else of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And when we began the 12th chapter last week, we have a shining example of one who in so many ways knows exactly who Jesus is, and she becomes an example to others about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, focused on what it is he is about to go through. You will recall last week as we began chapter 12, Mary anoints Jesus. Now Mary does this in an extraordinary way. Uh, she wiped her, his feet with her own hair, pouring a costly perfume on his feet. There's some criticism for that. But what Jesus tells everyone is that Mary is actually the one who is most aware of what it is Jesus is about to go through. Jesus is about to be crucified. He's going to be put to death. And what Mary does symbolically is prepare Jesus' body for his burial. She knows what's going on when others are not always so aware. Then we had this plot by the religious establishment to have Lazarus put to death. Now, Lazarus has just come back to life by Jesus. Jesus calls him by name, and as the good shepherd we know, as Jesus tells us, the shepherd calls his sheep by name. Lazarus comes out of the tomb after being in there for four days. But there is a focus on Lazarus of all people. In their effort to try to get to Jesus, the religious establishment makes a decision that maybe the best thing to do is put Lazarus to death. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what happens sometimes is there is collateral damage when one seeks to destroy an individual or a group, others will suffer along the way. It is shameful on the part of the religious folk, but that's what they're trying to do. Then Jesus begins his entry into Jerusalem, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem as the Messiah, the anointed one. People have had enough information about Jesus now whether or not it's completely accurate may be another story, but they begin to realize that Jesus is not like just anyone else. And there are those who begin to believe that he is the one they have been waiting for for generations, the Messiah, the anointed one, who's going to come in and liberate the Israelite people from control at the hands of the Romans. The problem is Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem, not on the back of a stallion like a great warrior or mighty, powerful leader, but instead on the back of a donkey, a symbol of peace. People have waved palm branches, shouting Hosanna, preparing for the coming of the Messiah. And there are even Greeks, non-Jewish people, who are intrigued by the Jewish traditions who are present and want to know more about Jesus himself. But now we begin with the 12th chapter, beginning with verse 27. As Jesus talks about his own impending death. Verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. Now that is a way of saying I'm scared. Jesus in John's gospel begins to become very much aware of what is soon to take place. As is the case with all of us, as I've mentioned before, if something is way off in the distance, sometimes we have almost a cavalier attitude about it. People will say, I'm supposed to have surgery in a few months to correct this situation. They say it very casually, but as the days draw closer and closer, and even the day of the surgery, that cavalier attitude has fallen by the wayside and there are nerves that have set in. There is a level of fear. That is certainly true with Jesus here. He says, now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. 
nor it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Now in the other gospels, Jesus is at the garden of Gethsemane. In John's gospel, he says, should I say, I don't wanna go through with this? And this is John's way of saying from the mouth of Jesus, no, I've gotta go through it. The hour has come, the time is at hand. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now this is a very important statement. Jesus is talking about his crucifixion. He is talking about his resurrection. And he is talking about his ascension. And then he says, I will draw all people to myself. Not just Jewish people. We see that what Jesus is saying is that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, the savior for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. It is a rather radical statement on the part of Jesus as he talks more and more about who he is and what it is he is soon to go through. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? The Son of Man is humanity's Savior. The Son of God and the Son of Man are interchangeable terms. The Son of Man, literally translated, means the human one. The one who is the Son of God is God in flesh. He is God in flesh, but he is human, and he is available to all people. Jesus said to them, the light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness may not overtake you. Of course, what Jesus is saying here is that he is the light. We are to walk in the presence of the light so that darkness does not overtake us. While that light is still there, claim it for oneself. Make it a part of who we are so that when darkness comes, darkness does not prevail, but the light will overcome that darkness. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. Believe so that you can be children of the light. At the very beginning of the Gospel of John, John tells us, that those who follow Jesus Christ are children of God. Here, Jesus says, they are children of light. The criteria to be a child of God in John's gospel is faith. In other words, in John's gospel, there are two types of creation regarding humanity. Everyone is created in the image of God, but then there's a distinction. Those who believe in Jesus Christ are the children of God, part of that family of God that is unique, who have claimed Jesus Christ as Lord. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. Although he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. Another example is we see oftentimes in scripture where despite what Jesus has said and despite what Jesus has done, there are those who choose for whatever reason not to believe. And in John's gospel, a sign represents a miracle. And John tells us here that there have been many, many signs done, many miracles that have taken place because of Jesus, by Jesus, and yet many still refuse to believe. Hatred can blind us to truth. Anger can blind us to that which is true. And in this case, in many instances, People being so angry with Jesus, they have become blind to the reality of who he really is, even as he stands in front of them performing one sign after another. This was to fulfill verse 38, the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
And so they could not believe because Isaiah also said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart so that they might not look with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal, excuse me, heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. So John reminds us that there are a lot of people who did choose to believe in Jesus, but they're silent followers because they don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. They'd rather remain in a prestigious position, remain in a position of authority and power than to claim Jesus Christ as Lord of their life and potentially lose some of that glory. Verse 44, then Jesus cried aloud, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in the one who sent me. We've seen that over and over again in John's gospel that Jesus talks about being sent from the Father, coming from the Father, returning to the Father, being one with the Father. The Father is one with him as we are one with Jesus Christ. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. Now look at verse 45. To see Jesus Christ is to see God. That clearly means Jesus is saying, I am God in flesh. If you see me, you see God. If you hear me, you hear God. If I touch you, you have received the touch of God. Jesus is emphatic about that. And as you can only imagine, think about those people who don't believe Jesus is who he claimed to be. Or think about people who are used to an understanding that anyone who claims to be God is to be put to death. There are a lot of people who would claim what Jesus says because they have seen the signs and heard the words and claimed it for themselves. And there are those who would, for whatever reason, refuse to believe and become that much more incensed when Jesus says once again that he is God in flesh. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in darkness. Remember, for John... From the mouth of Jesus, one either walks in the light of Jesus Christ or one walks in darkness. It is one or the other. There's no gray area with that. Verse 47, I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as judge. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. So Jesus, in his own ways, makes it abundantly clear. He is speaking the words of God. What comes out of his mouth has come directly from God. And I know that his commandments is eternal life. What I speak, therefore, I speak just as a father, the Father has told me. The level of intimacy that Jesus talks about in relationship with Almighty God is profound. He hammers it home over and over again to make it clear, to emphasize, and to make it concrete that he is the one who has come from the Father and will return to the Father. In the meantime, there are those who simply, for whatever reason, refuse to believe that or claim that for themselves, and they are going to do everything in their power to eliminate Jesus as a result. All right, now we continue as we look at the 13th chapter, a very unique story about Jesus with the disciples that is unique to the Gospel of John. It is not found in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. It is the washing of the disciples' feet. So let's look at this very closely. Chapter 13. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. That's John's way of saying Jesus knows that he is about to die, that there is going to be a resurrection, and that he will ascend to the Father. But that about to die part is hard for any human being. And remember, Jesus is fully human. His hour has come. His work 
and all his public ministry is winding down for this climactic event to take place. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love that stuff, love them to the end. That means that Jesus Christ loved them fully or to completion, totally. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas Simon, excuse me, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table. Now look at this. Took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. A towel represents being in a position of serving others, a position as a servant. Jesus symbolically, by wrapping that towel around his waist, literally becomes a visible example of what service looks like. Now remember who Jesus is. He's the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the anointed one, the savior of the world, and he is placed around his waist a towel as a servant, not as one who is to be served like any other king would be. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. Now, I cannot emphasize enough what it is that Jesus has done that would have shocked, even appalled, the disciples. In Jesus' day and time, it was customary if one came into my home, I would have provided a towel and a basin for he or she to wash his or her feet. I would have never washed their feet. That was a menial task. And history tells us that sometimes slaves were not even in a position to have to wash the feet of another. That was the lowliest of activities. So what Jesus has done is something that is unimaginable. This king, this savior, this anointed one, this one who is above all others, who has come from the Father, has knelt down before the ones he knows will deny, abandon, and betray him, and he takes on the role of su suffering servant and washes their feet. What do they do with that? How do they handle that? Jesus washing their feet. I remember an occasion where I was in a foot washing ceremony and quite frankly, I wasn't real comfortable with it. I'd never been a part of a foot washing ceremony before. I didn't want it to wash anybody else's feet and quite frankly, I didn't want to wash any, anybody wash my own feet. But I felt as the service progressed and I took on the responsibility of washing someone else's feet, that in my own mind, it wasn't something that was awful and dirty. It was my way of serving the one whose feet I washed. Then there was someone who did the same for me. It was someone that I did not have a lot of respect for who washed my feet. Someone who was a real problem for a lot of people in the church, including me, a troublemaker. But he washed my feet. And every time after that, I wanted to lash out at him in some way, I would always think, this is the man that washed my feet. This is the man who bowed down before me and washed my feet. And it at least gave me a different perspective. It didn't change his way of doing things. And eventually he left the church and went to another church. And I understand after that he became disgruntled and went to another church. And that's fine. But it changed my attitude and my outlook about how to deal with him because he washed my feet. He came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. It's another example in scripture where in the moment the disciples don't get it. They have no earthly idea why Jesus would be doing something like that. But then Jesus says, later you'll understand what this is all about. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. This is a ritualistic cleansing in some ways to make the disciples ready for what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. But Peter doesn't understand. It's about a relationship. It's not fundamentally about some kind of actual cleansing physically. It is a spiritual preparedness act on the part of Jesus. But Peter doesn't get that, and is often the case in the Gospels with Peter. He is so overzealous that when Jesus says, I have to wash your feet, then Peter says, well, then wash my whole body. Wash everything about me. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus, I am always amazed that Jesus would in his own way be a servant to the very ones he knows are going to harm him or at least be complicit in his harm. In his time of need, they're nowhere to be found. But as a servant to all, to the imperfect, to the sinful, to the failures, Jesus does what he does and serves as he has been called to do. An extraordinary act of on the part of our Lord. Verse 12. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and he returned to the table and said to them, Do you not know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, that would have been one of those statements again where they would have had difficulty with that. Jesus is saying, as you've seen me as an example of what service looks like, you are to be the same way. You are to be an example of service to other people. Those menial kinds of things that no one else would do, no one else wants to do, it's your responsibility to do them anyway. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Our great example always is Jesus Christ, the one who said, if we want to be exalted, we must be humble. If we want to be first, we've got to be last. If we want to win our lives, we have to lose ourselves for the sake of Jesus Christ. We have to be in service to other people. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, of course, that I was hungry and you fed me, or I was hungry and you didn't feed me, etc. The faithful say, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? And Jesus said, anytime you saw someone hungry and you fed them, you fed me. The unfaithful say, when did we ever see you hungry? And Jesus said, every time you ignored one who was in need, and who was hungry, you ignored me. In other words, very much, uh, very much part of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ is to be in service to the world in his holy name as he is that great example to all of us. I'm not speaking, excuse me, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. That's from Psalm 41. I tell you this now before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, remember what is important to understand is that this is John's account of what happens in the upper room. In Matthew and Mark and Luke, their emphasis is on the meal where Jesus says, this is my body in the bread and this is my blood in the cup. We've already seen in John's gospel, Jesus talk about the importance of us eating his body and drinking his blood. We do that through what we call communion, of course, that is symbolically in the bread and in the juice we take on and take in Jesus Christ. So for John, the emphasis was already on talking about, <coughs> excuse me, the body and blood. 
So instead of focusing on that in the upper room, John chooses instead to focus on what Jesus did with the disciples in washing their feet, this act of extraordinary service and exceptional humility on the part of our Lord. Let's continue on, verse 21. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. That means, again, he is scared. That inner angst, that fear, is a part of who he is. And declared, very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. It is an explicit announcement on the part of Jesus of betrayal by his closest friends. In this particular instance, he says, one of you will betray me. We know that one, of course, to be Judas Iscariot. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. Now, again, we see an example uh, on the part of the disciples. To the disciples, it's incomprehensible. It's the same response in all four Gospels. The disciples are almost incredulous. How can this be? This couldn't possibly happen. But we've seen over and over again their lack of faith. And it's easy for them to pass judgment on somebody else. But the truth is, all of the disciples may not betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but they will deny him and they will certainly abandon him in his greatest time of need. All of them are complicit. All of them are responsible. All of them will cause him pain by their inaction, their lack of faith. One of the disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now we know that the one whom Jesus loved is John himself, the writer of this gospel. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. In other words, we want to know who you're talking about, Jesus, who's going to betray you. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he had received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Now, that's interesting to note. This was the last chance for Judas to back out of the betrayal of Jesus. Jesus provides him something to eat, this kind of intimate act of sharing one's food. And yet, it is in that the sharing of the food that Jesus makes it clear who is going to be the one who betrays him. And John says that's the moment in which Satan entered Judas when Jesus shared what he had with Judas. Do quickly what you're going to do. No one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him to buy what we need for the festival or what we sh should give to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. I want you to see something important here. It was night. Jesus is going to leave, excuse me, Judas is going to leave Jesus. And John makes sure we understand it's nighttime. Judas leaves Jesus because he loves darkness more than light. He is in the presence of the light, but he chooses to go out into the darkness because he is now possessed by Satan. It is Judas walking in darkness. It is John's symbolic way of telling us what Judas is now experiencing. He has abandoned the light, and when one abandons the light, he now has become a part of that which is dark and evil. Remember in John's gospel, darkness represents evil, destruction, Satan, death. It was night. And when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. The Son of Man, the one who is flesh, who is coming from God. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I have said to the Jews, so I now say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. 
I will give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. We're going to stop right there. We will pick up next week with what it is Jesus is talking about when he makes this statement about love and the significance of what that means for all of us. I appreciate you once again being a part of our Wednesday evening Bible study. I know many of you watch it at other times during the week, but I'm grateful that you would choose to be a part of our study of the Gospel of John once again. Blessings on the rest of your week.